Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. In this series of talks on the Satipatthana Sutta, we've discussed in some detail, starting last year, the mindfulness of the body, and now in these last couple of weeks, mindfulness of feelings. Tonight I'd like to move on to the third contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta, which is contemplating or mindful of the mind. It's again interweaving elements of Venerable Analyo's very clear analysis from his book Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization. So the Buddha begins this section of the sutta with a rhetorical question. He says, and how bhikkhus? And again, bhikkhus here means anyone who is practicing. And how bhikkhus does one, in regard to the mind, contemplate the mind? And then he goes on to answer. One knows a lustful mind to be lustful, and a mind without lust to be without lust. One knows an angry mind to be angry, and one without anger to be without anger. One knows a deluded mind to be deluded, and one without delusion to be one without delusion. So it's pretty straightforward here. In this list of these mindful, these different states, the Buddha is emphasizing the three unwholesome roots of mind and how they color or condition our minds. Now these roots are translated from the Pali in a variety of ways. So lust is the translation here of raga, Pali word raga. It means lust, desire, greed. The Pali word dosa means angry or anger, hatred, ill will, aversion. And moha is translated often as delusion or ignorance, or confusion, or bewilderment. So you see, in English we have many different words, and maybe if we put them all together we get a full sense of what the Buddha was talking about with these three unwholesome roots. In the sutta and the translation we've been using, they've used the words again and again, lustful mind, angry mind, deluded mind. But again, think big when you think of those states. But the Buddha is also saying not only to be mindful of these unwholesome roots when they're present in the mind, but also to know when they are absent. And this is a critical piece. Here the Buddha is following a usage that's common in the suttas where the absence of an unwholesome state implies the full range of its wholesome counterpart. So, for example, the wholesome roots of mind are known as non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. So when we hear those words... (coughs) we have to understand that it's not merely the absence of the kalesas, of the defilements, but it also implies all the positive qualities. For example, in non-greed, 
non-greed in its fullest expression is the quality of generosity. Non-hatred is the quality of love or compassion. Non-delusion is the quality of ignorance. Now there's a very interesting implication here. And one that actually points to some of the long-standing disagreements between the different schools of Buddhism. And that is the understanding that in the absence of greed, generosity manifests spontaneously. Generosity is there in the absence of greed. Love and compassion is there in the absence of hatred. Wisdom and right view are there in the absence of delusion. This is just expressed in one of uh, the teachings of Kensi Rinpoche uh, in a different context, but it points to the same uh, understanding where he said, when you recognize the selfless nature of phenomena, the energy to bring about the good of others dawns uncontrived and effortless. Saying the same thing, in the absence of self-centeredness, when we understand selflessness, automatically, in that understanding, the energy to bring about the good of others dawns uncontrived and effortless. This is the feeling of compassion. By emphasizing the recognition and the knowing of the unwholesome roots of lust, of anger, of delusion, and the wholesome ones, that is the absence of those states, the Buddha is highlighting the wise discernment between what is skillful and what is not skillful. And that discernment is very pragmatic. He uses the words unskillful or unwholesome to describe those states which lead to suffering. And he describes as skillful or wholesome those states that lead to happiness. So it's a very pragmatic assessment. This wise discernment between what is skillful and what is unskillful in terms of mind states is basic to the Buddha's teachings. But in our culture, it's also very problematic. Because for many people, especially here in the West, it's a very easy step from recognizing a particular mind state as being unwholesome. It's a very easy step from that to thinking, I'm a bad person for having it. We seem to make that move very easily. Or to think, in the recognition that something is unwholesome, to think that it's wrong that it's arising. I must be doing something wrong in my practice. But of course, this reaction of self-judgment of more aversion, more suffering. I'm a bad person for having this arise. This shouldn't be happening. This is wrong. All of that is a not very helpful cycle. It just leads to more suffering. So it's important to understand in this first instruction on mindfulness of the mind, this discernment of what is skillful and what is unskillful, that we do this not in order to judge ourselves or to be reactive to the states, 
but rather in order to see which states should be cultivated in our lives, which are onward leading to happiness, and which we should let go of. Those that lead to suffering for ourselves, for other people. This distinction between wholesome and unwholesome mind states brings a moral dimension into psychology. Of course, this is the basis, this is the foundation on which the Buddhist teachings rests. Why is this so important? Because it's not only that these different mind states are arising in our minds, they very often are the motivation for our actions in the world. And when we look around in the world, why do we see so much avoidable suffering? Now, there's so much violence, hunger, war, injustice. What is happening in these situations? It's people acting out unwholesome mind states of greed, of hatred, of fear. So for our own happiness and for peace in the world, we need to know what is skillful and what is unskillful. And we need to recognize these states when they arise in our minds. The Dalai Lama emphasized this point in a very beautiful and striking way. When he said that actions, and and I might say a very un-American way, he said that actions should not ultimately be judged by their success or failure, but by the motivation behind them. And that's a very radical statement. That's saying that we measure the moral worth of an action not by its success or failure, but by the quality of the motivation behind them. We cannot always or even often control outcomes, but we can take responsibility for our own hearts and minds. And this is precisely what this third foundation of mindfulness is teaching us to do. So how can we know the lustful mind as being lustful and one without lust as being without lust? And similarly for ill will or anger and delusion. There's a verse in the Dhammapada, that wonderful collection of teachings in verse form, that describes very succinctly how these different unwholesome roots of mind manifest. So it's kind of a pointer to what we can look for. This verse says, There is no fire like lust, no grip like anger, no net like delusion. There is no fire like lust, no grip like anger, no net like delusion. So in practicing mindfulness of the mind, we need to see for ourselves, and this is our own direct investigation, how we are experiencing these states in our own minds. How do they manifest? we might feel the feverish excitability of lust. You know, there is that that kind of feverish quality to it when the mind is filled with lust. We might feel the contraction, the heaviness, the tightness, the alienation when the mind is filled with anger or aversion or hatred. We might feel confusion, the confused entanglement of delusion. 
Gurudasa, who was he was a one of the great time masters of the last century, he described the manifestation of these three unwholesome roots in another way. He described the tendency towards lust or desire as pulling in, and the tendency towards aversion as pushing away. And my favorite is describing delusion as running around in circles. You know, and it's just that you can just picture the mind just doing that. So that's another way, if we pay attention to the energy movement of the mind, you know, we might feel the heat of desire or the tightness of anger or the confusion of delusion, or we might feel the energy movement of going towards, you know, something, we're trying to pull something in, the desire, pushing away as aversion, running around in circles as delusion. And in following these instructions, we also become mindful when these states are absent. We need to notice the absence of greed, the absence of hatred, the absence of delusion, when we're not in the grip of these unwholesome roots. A very insightful place to observe this is as you become aware, as you're mindful of the mind filled with lust, for example, desire, wanting of some kind, and you're mindful and you're noting, you're noting, you're noting, pay particular attention to the moment when that mind state disappears. You know, it's there, it's there, it's there, and at a certain point, it's not there. Right in that moment of transition, there's a tremendous illumination of the mind free of lust, free of desire. We have that contrast which is so vivid in that moment. And it is the feeling of being let out of the grip of something. For some reason, though, we seem to have a greater fascination with the difficulties. There's a neurotic fascination, I think. But somehow it's easier for us to focus on what's difficult in our practice. And we often overlook the presence of the unwholesome states of mind. And of course, this becomes a major contribution to how we view ourselves In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha is very explicitly giving equal importance, mindfulness when the unskillful states are there, mindful when the skillful states are there, which often we experience as the absence of the unskillful. So don't overlook that. As we practice recognizing each of these states and how they are manifesting in our experience and and naming them as a way, using the noting, as a way of really framing them, as our recognition becomes clearer, as the perception of them become clearer, it's like putting a frame around the experience so then we can become mindful of the experience in a deeper way, free of words, free of concepts. And this move is described very well uh, in some lines by the author Michael Cunningham in the book The Hours, where he says, everything in the world has its own secret name, a name that cannot be conveyed in language, but is simply the sight and the feel of the thing itself. I love that. The secret name of things that cannot be conveyed in language, in words, but is simply the sight and the feel of the thing itself. That's mindfulness. So we recognize this is the lustful mind, this is the angry mind, this is the deluded mind or absent 
of those states. But then we simply use those concepts, those words, to then drop in directly to the experience. <clears throat> now these instructions <clears throat> to know whether the wholesome roots are present or the unwholesome roots are present, the Buddha is pointing something out which is quite central on this path of freedom. Because by implication, what the Buddha is saying here is that these kalesas, these unwholesome roots, because they are not always present, are what is called adventitious. That's not a usual word in English. What adventitious means is something that is not inherent or not innate. So the Buddha is saying here, these unwholesome roots of greed, of hatred, delusion, and all their manifestations are not inherent to the mind. They are not innate to the mind. They are not the nature of the mind itself. They come as visitors when the different conditions for their arising arise. And there's quite a well-known teaching on this, where the Buddha said, the mind, O bhikkhus, is luminous. It is clouded by visiting defilements. The mind, O bhikkhus, is luminous. It is freed from visiting defilements. So this understanding that the unwholesome roots are not innate to the mind suggests a very different attitude in working with these states when they arise than the way we usually revert to. So instead of drowning in the greed or the desire or the anger or the aversion or the delusion, instead of drowning in them, or judging them, or denying them, what the Buddha is saying, simply be mindful. Be mindful when they're present. Be mindful when they're not present. It's amazingly direct. Instead of reacting, instead of judging, instead of fighting with, the Buddha is saying, one knows when these are present, one knows when these are not present. But as my teacher, my first teacher, Manindraji, would often say about practice, this is very simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but not easy. Now, for so many years, I would struggle with the difficulties in my practice thinking that I was a bad yogi whenever the defilements would arise in my mind. You know, I couldn't concentrate. So I would have all of these judgments about it. Or even in more intense times of psychological dismay, you know, especially in those times when I was working with intense fear, I just started seeing myself as this total psychological catastrophe. You know, and thinking... This is going to need 30 years of therapy to unwind. It took a while in being with these different difficult, unwholesome states of mind, it took a while to actually follow the Buddhist teachings. Because the habit of reaction, the habit of judgment, self-judgment, was so strong. What the Buddha is saying is that these difficult mind states <clears throat> are not in themselves a problem or a mistake, but are simply part of the path. When we're mindful, the mind is like this, it's like this, it's like this. We begin to see their ephemeral, impermanent, empty nature. 
So when I began to see this and not judge myself for these kalesas that were arising, there was actually a certain joy that came into my practice. You know, I would see one of these defilements and it was almost a smile because I realized deeply that I would much rather see and explore them than not see them and simply act them out. So the clear seeing even of the unwholesome states, brought a certain level of joy and a tremendous amount of interest in the practice. So this is the first set of instructions on mindfulness of mind. The second set of instructions, which follows, is to know the contracted mind as contracted, and the distracted mind as distracted. So what do these terms mean here? Contracted refers to the inner withdrawal of the mind due to sloth and torpor. You know, where there's little or no energy to actually meet the object. There's that sense of heaviness or dullness. It's the mind collapsing inward. And we've all had that experience in our practice. That's the contracted mind, and the Buddha is saying, know the contracted mind as contracted. And then the distracted mind, distraction here means distracted through restlessness with the mind going out to sense objects, you know, seeking different kinds of sense contact, sense pleasures due to restlessness. When we look at the progression of the sutta and these instructions, there's an interesting development in them. First, we develop awareness of the three unwholesome and wholesome roots of mind. Becoming mindful of them so that we are actually free and unattached in the experience of them. Next, the Buddha is saying, be mindful of the contracted mind due to sloth, be mindful of the distracted mind due to restlessness, and by not becoming lost in or identified with either of these states, we actually find the balance between them. We don't collapse inward. We don't get agitated outward, outwardly. And so in that balance, the mind opens up to the experience of higher states of concentration and awareness, which follow in the sutta. What I find reassuring about these teachings and these instructions and this reassurance actually becomes a great support for us is that they fully acknowledge the difficulties that come in our practice. It's not as if somehow we need to have our mind completely freed of all of these unwholesome states, all of these difficult states, in order to proceed. Here the Buddha is saying that mindfulness of them when they arise is itself the path to freedom. So in this way, the teachings in the Satipatthana Sutta are quite unique. In many other places, different discourses of the Buddha, he says, or he teaches, that you should replace unskillful thoughts with skillful ones. And then he describes different ways of doing it. Now he says, we can reflect on the dangers of unskillful thoughts and feelings. We can 
ignore them and just deflect our mind to something more skillful. You know, you're feeling angry, you know, do metta. He says we can get rid of the unskillful states by examining their causes. And as a last resort, this is a quote from the sutta, with teeth clenched or pressing the tongue against the roof of the mouth, one should beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. That is crushing unwholesome states with wholesome ones. But in this discourse on the four foundations of mindfulness, on the Satipatthana discourse, he's giving us a very different teaching. And that's why it's such a powerful and direct way of looking at our minds. In the Satipatthana discourse, he's not suggesting we oppose the unwholesome ones with wholesome ones. He's not suggesting that we overcome them or crush them. But rather, the instruction is simply with bare attention, with mindful knowing, with that mirror-like wisdom of mind, we simply know each state for what it is, seeing it as being impermanent, seeing it as being insubstantial, seeing it as being not self You see the difference between these approaches? Sometimes, as a last resort in certain situations, we might need to crush the mind. The mind. So it's it's good to know all the all the possibilities. But in the practice of satipatthana, that is not the primary approach. Later on in the sutta, in the fourth foundation, that's called Mindfulness of Dhammas, there's a further and more complete investigation of each of these mind states. There's a, there's a more complete investigation of the hindrances, of the factors of enlightenment. So it goes into them quite explicitly and in a lot of detail. But in this third foundation... This mindfulness of the mind, the emphasis is on simply noticing the general quality of the mind as it is being influenced by these different mental qualities that are arising. As it's being influenced by different moods, by different emotions. So I'd like to give you two specific arenas in which I found this application of mindfulness, mindfulness of the mind, particularly helpful because contained within this practice, when we understand it correctly, it can open up a great place of freedom and understanding. So the first place that I found it very helpful is applying it in times when I feel that I'm struggling. When I'm struggling in my practice, when I'm struggling in life, when there's just that feeling of struggle. When for one reason or another, we are just somewhat disconnected from what's going on. You know, and it, there's a lack of ease. You know, at that time, often there's a feeling of efforting or of, of forcing a certain kind of effort. You know, we're trying so hard, but not being very successful. So what to do at these times? And again, this can happen in our lives. It can happen at different times in our meditation where we're just struggling with what's going on. Very helpful at those times to simply sit back, open up, and ask the question, 
the very simple question, what's happening? Because very often there's some experience, some state that's present that we're simply not acknowledging. You know, maybe it's a state of dullness that we're trying to fight our way through. Or maybe there's a distracted, restless energy just with a lot of thoughts and we're struggling with that. Or maybe it's the angry mind, you know, and we're just lost in the story of it. In each case, when we simply acknowledge and accept what is present, in the words of the sutta, one knows a lustful mind as being lustful, an angry mind as being angry, a deluded mind as being deluded, a contracted mind as being contracted, a distracted mind as being distracted. When we simply open up and recognize through that question, what's happening? What is the state of mind now? What is our experience? Recognize it, acknowledge it, accept it. In that moment, the mind is no longer struggling. It's simply knowing with bare attention, the mind is like this. The mind is like this. The feeling of struggle then, instead of being a problem, becomes a very effective feedback. Because it's always telling us that something is going on that we're not accepting. Because if we were accepting it, we wouldn't be struggling. There's something very useful about paying attention to this. I'd like to read a few lines from a poem by Derek Walcott, which the name of the poem is Love After Love and suggests this possibility of instead of fighting with what's arising, instead of not seeing and not accepting, there's another possibility. So he writes, The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. It's like this contemplation of mind. It's like meeting ourselves at the front door. The second way that I found especially useful in applying this contemplation of mind, the first is in times of struggle. The second is in the awareness, just as we go through the day, of the background moods and emotions that are present. You know, so often we can go through a day or part of a day influenced, being influenced by a certain mood. You know, maybe we're feeling sad or boredom or excitement <laughs> or irritation, annoyance, grumpiness. Or maybe there's, there's clarity, you know, and interest or depression or happiness. There are so many different moods. But because these moods are so amorphous and so generalized, we often don't really recognize that they're present, so we sink into them. They become the unconscious filter on our experience. It's like looking at the world through colored glasses. 
emotions and moods are often what we most personalize. You know, even as we see sensations coming and going and thoughts coming and going and get a sense of them being not self, still when there's a strong mood or emotion, it's so easy to take it to be self. I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm happy. You know, we build this superstructure of self on top of the shifting sands of our experience. But as we practice mindfulness of the mind, following these instructions of the Buddha, we notice more clearly what mood or what emotion is present through the day and how it is coloring our consciousness, how it is coloring our awareness. And this is the interesting part. As we practice mindfulness of the mind, as it's colored by these different moods, we begin to experience both the mind and the mood free of the sense, free of the idea of self. So instead of I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm sad, there's much more the sense of the angry mind is like this, the happy mind is like this, the sad mind is like this. It's a very different perspective. And there's both much more interest in the quality of the mood itself and much more interest in the quality of the mind that is not identified with it. We really get a taste of freedom. Ajahn Chah wrote something so to this point. And what he wrote is a very clear description of this contemplation of mind. He said, within itself, the mind is already peaceful. That the mind is not peaceful these days is because it follows moods. It becomes agitated because moods deceive it. Sense impressions come and trick it into unhappiness, suffering, gladness, and sorrow. But the mind's true nature is none of these things. Gladness or sadness is not the mind but only a mood coming to deceive us. The untrained mind gets lost and follows these things. It forgets itself. And then we think that it is we who are upset or at ease or whatever. But really this mind of ours is already unmoving and peaceful. So we must train the mind to know these sense impressions and not get lost in them. And just this is the aim of all this practice we put ourselves through. Notice through the day how often moods come and deceive us. Where we become identified with them, lost in them. And then see if it's possible to apply this contemplation of the mind where we're looking at the mood, we're looking at the emotion. Oh, the angry mind is like this, the sad mind is like this, the happy mind is like this. There's an amazing openness that begins to happen in our experience. Just hold it. In the last part of the instructions on the mind, the Buddha speaks of knowing a great mind to be great and a narrow one to be narrow, a surpassable mind to be surpassable and an unsurpassable one to be unsurpassable, a concentrated mind to be concentrated 
and an unconcentrated mind to be unconcentrated. And finally, a liberated mind to be liberated and an unliberated one to be unliberated. So what is he talking about in this particular progression? The first three of these pairs has to do with becoming mindful of different levels or different qualities of concentration. So a great mind and a narrow mind refers to how far our concentration pervades the object. So, for example, if you're doing metta, if the metta is directed to just a single person, so that would be a narrow mind. When the metta is pervaded to all beings in all directions, that would be called a great mind because the pervasion is very large. Surpassable and unsurpassable refers to uh, levels of jhana, levels of concentration. Surpassable means are there higher levels yet to be experienced? Unsurpassable, have we reached a level of concentration, of the highest level of concentration possible? So we know when the mind is narrow, when it's great, when it's surpassable, when it's unsurpassable, when it's concentrated or unconcentrated. And here concentration refers to not only the fixed object, you know, in samatha, in concentration practice, but also momentary concentration in vipassana practice. So you can notice during the day, you can apply this application of mindfulness You're with changing objects as the breath, sensations, thoughts, emotions, moods. With all of these changing objects, do you have what's called momentary concentration, moment to moment? We're aware, we're mindful, we're connected, or not? Are we lost? Are we scattered? Are we unconcentrated? Now, what's helpful to remember here, and this is probably the hardest part of these instructions is that we can be mindful and we should be mindful both when the mind is concentrated and when it's unconcentrated. So if you're sitting and the mind is scattered, it's unconcentrated, that's no excuse for not being mindful. Because the Buddha is saying Know when the mind is concentrated. Know when the mind is unconcentrated. This is very important because it is telling us that there is nothing outside the scope of the practice. It's not that we have to wait for concentration in order to be mindful. And these words are so explicit and so direct. Know the mind when it's like this. Know the mind when it's like this. However the mind is, in whatever state, it's great, it's narrow, it's surpassable, it's unsurpassable, it's concentrated, it's unconcentrated, it's full of lust, it's absent of lust. You know, there's anger, there's no anger. Whatever the state of mind is, the Buddha is saying, be mindful of it, know it, just as it is. So this gives tremendous opportunity for us in our practice. There's no time at all when we cannot be mindful. Okay, and in the very last line of these teachings... Mindfulness of the mind. The Buddha says one knows the mind, the liberated mind to be liberated and the unliberated mind to be unliberated. So liberated here means both full awakening, the mind having uprooted all the defilements, all the glaces, 
but it also refers to the mind temporarily freed of the unwholesome states. And this happens very often in the course of our Vipassana practice. There are many moments through the day when the mind is free of greed, free of hatred, free of delusion. So we could call that temporary liberation. Know the mind at those times. You know, given our propensity to focus on difficulties, to focus on the problems, to focus on the unwholesome things, it would be a very good practice to pay attention through the day to all of those many times when the mind is free of these unwholesome roots, when the mind is free of greed, free of lust, free of aversion. I mean, is there anyone here who lusts all day long? Probably not. You know, or who's angry all day? No. They are adventitious, these defilements. They're visitors to the mind. Notice when they're there. Know when they're there. Know when they're not there. We need to pay attention to those times when the mind is free. So we learn to recognize it. And the clearer the recognition of it, the easier access, the more we abide in it. It was one of the Tibetan teachers, Tukko Ergin, he described this practice of liberation in a very helpful way. He said, this practice of liberation is short moments many times. So it's not that we have to somehow accomplish some pure high state and then hold on to it and sustain it, which you've probably noticed doesn't work that well. But rather short moments, many times, recognizing when the mind is free. So I'd like to close with... One last teaching from Ajahn Man, who was the grandfather of the Thai forest tradition. He was this remarkable, remarkable monk. And there's a wonderful biography of him uh, by, by another of the now very old Thai forest masters, uh, Ajahn Mahabua. Uh, but this is, this is from the teachings of Ajahn Man. He said, of all the many things that people value and care for in the world, the mind is the most precious. In fact, the mind is the foremost treasure in the whole world, so be sure to look after it well. To realize the mind's true nature is to realize Dhamma. Understanding the mind is the same as understanding Dhamma. Once the mind is known then Dhamma in its entirety is known. Arriving at the truth about one's mind is the attainment of Nibbana. Clearly, the mind is a priceless possession that should never be overlooked. These teachings in the third foundation of mindfulness, contemplating the mind, in a very clear way, give us the instructions to look into the mind, to look at it directly, to know it just as it is. To realize the mind's true nature is to realize Dhamma. Clearly the mind is a priceless possession that should never be overlooked. Let's sit for a few moments. <clears throat> 